Thing. Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! But first, she's represented neighbouring Derby South since 1983, in the process becoming the longest serving woman MP in history. If there's one person who knows the politics of this area better than anyone else, it's the former Foreign Secretary, Dame Margaret Beckett. Thank you very much for joining us uh, on the programme um, here today. Um, before we talk about what happened in the local elections, I'm quite interested to get your thoughts on Labour's new policy announced today, uh, that they want to guarantee no tax rises for people earning under £80,000 a year, leaving the door open, of course, for uh, higher taxes for those on over that amount. Do you, do you think that's a good policy for them to be having? Yes, I do. Um, I think it's very sensible. We want to make it clear that no matter what might be said about us, that we're actually on the side of, of ordinary families wanting to, to get on, having aspiration, having ambitions for their future, and that we want to be fair to people across the board. And I think the, the pledge on things like VAT is particularly important because that's always been the Conservatives' weapon of choice. Are you tying your hands, though, by refusing to put up taxes for such a large number of people? Well, to a certain extent, yes, but you know, so many people are really under pressure, um, really feeling much worse off, and a lot of people are suffering from cuts to things like uh, tax credits and so on. So I think it's the right thing to do to give people reassurance, because the Conservatives are bound to say that we will put up everybody's taxes massively, because they always say that, no matter what it says in our manifesto, or no matter what the likelihood. Now, you've represented Derby South since 1983. Mm. And this year, of course, Derbyshire Council uh, turned from red to blue, the first time that's happened when Labour's in opposition. I mean, for someone representing the area and having such a long history with the area, that must have been pretty heartbreaking to see. Yes, I was, I was very sorry to see it, and it's unfortunate because I think they were a good county council. And the last time we had a Conservative county council, I think a lot of people who voted for them regretted it very sharply afterwards. Um, but, you know, these things happen. Uh, it, it may be the first time we've lost one in opposition, but it isn't the first time we've lost the county council. We just have to work hard to get it back. So why do you think it is that people in Derbyshire, in the constituencies that you represent, why are they turning away from Labour? Well, in my constituency, there wasn't an election. This was a of county course. council um, election. And, you know, pe people are disillusioned. People are fed up. Um, and, it, and it's natural. And to be fair, the government has done a very, very good job of blaming local authorities for all the problems people are facing. And, and very many people seem to have swallowed the government line, that, oh, but it's your council that's doing this to you, when actually councils, Tory, Labour, Liberal, whatever they are, are being driven by cuts from the government. Because you say that people are fed up, so why are they not taking out on the Conservatives? Why are they taking out on Labour then? That's what I'm struggling to understand. Well, I mean, we've got a mixed picture. It, it hasn't happened everywhere. It's a very optimistic way of looking well, at no, when you've no, it, it is lost hundreds picture. of seats. I mean, I was talking to um, my colleague Vernon Kirker, uh, who tells me that in his constituency, they returned all of the, of the county councillors for Labour. But overall, so, you, you know, lost it, nearly it 400 oh, seats. Oh, I'm not, don't get me wrong, I am not pretending it wasn't a really bad result. I am not saying that. All I'm saying is, it wasn't true everywhere, and what we've got to do is find out where things went right and repeat it. Now, um, Jeremy Corbyn said in the wake of those council uh, results, that Labour was closing the gap on the Conservatives. Uh, John McDonnell, talking about Wales, for example, said it wasn't a wipeout people expected. There was that almost celebratory um, conference in Manchester after Andy Burnham won there, where Rebecca Long Bailey described Jeremy Corbyn as the next Prime Minister. On a day when you lost all those seats, do you think the leadership and those around the leadership really get the fight that Labour's in right now? I, th I think they do, but I think that you don't encourage people to realise that it's important how they vote and to vote for you by being totally defeatist. And I think the thing that is... The, the other morning I heard somebody on the radio saying that... Um, it made my blood run cold, to be honest. Uh, the, the Prime Minister hasn't just got a plan for Brexit, she's got a plan for Britain. Yeah, I believe that, and I don't like the sound of it. I mean, um, one of the things I was thinking about just recently, I don't know if you saw the stories about the, the man who, who died, who uh, made a point of pointing out how much less 
his widow and family will get if he lived beyond a date which was, I think, about a week ago. And indeed, that has happened. Widows now have, widowed mothers, now have 18 months grace when they will get some support of the state for themselves and their children to get over the loss of a partner. That's, that's not the kind of country I want to live in, and that's the kind of country Theresa May is promoting. So why is it then that Labour's traditional voters, people who would be affected by the policies that you describe, are leaving the party in droves, are going towards the Conservatives? I think, one of the, I think there are two problems which, I mean, everybody always says it's classical, but it doesn't mean it's completely wrong. One of the problems is that they don't necessarily know what we are saying, although hopefully we will re redress that. A bigger problem, I think, is that it's not really being brought home to them yet what the present government are actually doing. In my opinion, that's the key reason why Theresa May went for an election. It's for party purposes, not for the, because of the national interest. But I think the key thing is she knows perfectly well that a lot of these changes are in the law, but they're only just coming in. By the autumn, people might have caught on. At the moment, they haven't really. And if it doesn't affect them, it hasn't sort of been brought home to them. And I think it's that lack of focus on what the government's doing to families that is one of our biggest problems. So the electorate are being fooled, do you think? No, I think they're just not being kept very well informed. <laughs> very diplomatic. Uh, <laughs> uh, and, you know, if, if people don't fully realise what's happening and haven't taken it in, they don't start to get indignant and they don't realise the risks that they may be running. If, if she gets a landslide, Heaven help our health service, our school service, our public services as a whole. Now, of course, um, the polls suggest that if not a landslide, she's going to win a, an emphatic majority. There was a report this week in The Times uh, that Labour MPs had got together and said that if Jeremy Corbyn, if the Labour lost more than 150 seats, which of course you did uh, in the local council elections, then someone should call on Jeremy Corbyn to go. And you were identified in this article as someone having sufficient authority <laughs> and respect to I make that this. plea to <laughs> Jeremy Corbyn. Did you ever have any of those conversations? No. <laughs> if I, I wouldn't know whether anybody had those conversations, <laughs> but certainly nobody's had them with me, I can assure you. And do you think that it would help if Jeremy Corbyn wasn't the leader ahead of the uh, general election? I think that if there's one thing that the public do not want to hear from Labour at the moment, it's about any internal differences that we have. This is a general election. We are fighting to try and protect the national interest and the people we were elected to represent. If we take time off from that to argue about our own internal differences, we're mad. You said you were a moron for nominating him for the leadership. No, somebody else said it, actually. And you agreed? Well, I, you know, <laughs> I thought, let it go. <laughs> so you don't think you're a moron, then? No, what I'm saying is, I think now it's really important that we're addressing and standing up for the national interest and for the people of this country. That's what we should all be doing. And if Labour do lose this election, should Jeremy Corbyn resign then? Well, we'll worry about that when it happens. It hasn't happened yet. You know, when I, all my life, people have talked as if the outcome of elections was a foregone conclusion. Oh, so-and-so can't happen. People will never do that. People can do, especially in our electoral system, People can do what they like. How they cast their votes will make a difference to the outcome. And people should remember that they might get what they vote for and look at what it is they'd get. Let's not um, move on from Jeremy Corbyn, because, of course, it is easy just to kind of scapegoat uh, the leader for all of Labour's issues. And actually, they run far deeper, don't they? It does feel, yes. uh, in some ways, that Labour is struggling to find a voice when on Brexit, for example, when, <clears throat> sorry, excuse me, um, Labour supporters are so divided between leave and remain, there seems to have been almost a dearth of ideas from... I think people across the country are divided. I mean, one of the things the Prime Minister said that I think was totally wrong, she said, oh, the people are coming together and Westminster is not... I don't, I'm afraid, I'm sorry to say it, but I don't see the people coming together over Brexit. I think those of us who fear that Brexit could be extremely damaging to our economy and to our country's future, are very fearful, remain very fearful. And, and people who thought Brexit was the right thing are full of hope. You know, I'd, I'd love to think they're right. And what, do you think that Labour's doing enough as an opposition to try and shape Brexit? Because it does feel, from an outsider sometimes, that the party's position is very nuanced. And so there is a risk of just falling down beneath the cracks, not really being solidly for Brexit, not really be solidly for Remain, such as the Liberal Democrats. 
You see, I, I think the easy thing is to say, as for example the Liberal Democrats do, oh, let's just, let's just undo it all, let's just reverse it. Um, that doesn't respect the decision of the British people. I don't like, I won't pretend, I don't like the decision of the British people at all. I am very fearful for the future of my constituents. But I accept that that's the decision they made, and so we have to make the best of it. Making the best of things isn't always clear-cut and glamorous, but it's actually what practical politicians are supposed to do, and I wish I thought it was what the Prime Minister's doing. Now, um, you were commissioned to write a report into why mm. Labour lost the 2015 uh, general election. I'm just going to have a look now at some of your conclusions, which was an inability to deal with issues of connection like immigration, a leader who wasn't judged as strong as the leader of the Conservatives, exceptionally vitriolic and personal attacks in the press. Mm. I mean, it's remarkable because you could be talking about the current situation for the Labour Party there, couldn't you? Well, yes, there's a lot in, a lot in common um, with what was happening then. Uh, we weren't able to overcome it last time. We've got to try harder. Do you think there's a risk, though, that Labour can identify the problems, as you did there, but there's not much in the way of solutions? No, I think um, a lot of our policies are the, the right policies. Um, they are geared to help the people who... Um, well, actually, the majority of people, and particularly the people who most need help, I think there's a lot to be said for what the Labour Party is saying and standing for. But this is the issue, isn't it? Because you're right, some of the polling does suggest that Labour's policies are popular, but they still don't really like the messenger. They're still not benefiting you. It's, the message isn't getting through. One of the things that I think is, is really, really awkward, almost unpleasant about the background of this election, is the kind of triumphalist, um, you know, um, we, we must soar over everything, I want a massive majority, I want a massive mandate. I, it doesn't, to my mind, and uh, I say this with respect, because I do respect her as a human being, but I think I've had rather more experience of international negotiation than Theresa May. I don't think it makes a blind bit of difference. As long as she's the Prime Minister, that's what makes the difference. It doesn't matter what, how big a majority she gets. This is all nonsense. This is all to serve the interests of the Conservative Party. But I, I do worry that um, the bigger the majority, the more they will feel they can ride roughshod. There's an awful lot of public spending cuts in the pipeline that haven't hit people yet. Why has she gone now? Because in a year's time, things might look very different. People ought to think about that when they decide where to put their cross. Now, you mentioned in that answer your kind of experience uh, as a politician, and I am quite interested in your sort of personal journey and your years in Parliament, because you actually started off much closer to Jeremy Corbyn on some issues, uh, more left on some issues. You voted for Tony Benn, for example, I did. Uh, in that sort of infamous deputy leadership election. So while Jeremy Corbyn appears to have stayed with those principles, what's changed for you? I, mean, I think you'll find I haven't changed all that much either. Um, if I may say so, part of the problem with people in your profession is that you have little boxes and you put people in them. And I've always been in the little box labelled something of the order of soft left, centre left. I haven't particularly moved. The landscape's moved around me quite often. I'll tell you one area where I genuinely have changed, and that is over Europe. I was very, very much opposed. And, you know, People say, oh, nobody told us this, that, the other. Well, yes, actually, those of us who didn't want to stay in the common market did point out to all the implications of us doing so, but we did. And then the common market itself changed. Uh, yes, all right, it's not exactly the, the trading group that people thought, but the Scandinavian countries have come in. It is now very much Europe, and I have become a passionate pro-European because I think it's in Britain's interest. And as someone who lived through the effect of civil war really uh, that no, Labour was not. in in that time, how is it compared to now? Oh, I'm happy to say that people are much more collegiate and friendly really? these days. Genuinely. I don't mean there isn't bad feelings sometimes. I don't mean that people don't get very angry. Of course they do. But I, I don't, there, there was a level of rage and bitterness when, uh, even before I became an MP, but when I was working around the party, um, that, that there isn't now. Pe people, have, people have grown up. It's, it's a lot nicer. There are a lot more women. That might have helped. That might have helped. And perhaps the fact you're not on Twitter might have helped as well. Oh, yes, absolutely. <laughs> I'm not on Twitter. <laughs> Dame Margaret Beckett, thank you very much for your time.